Now, this with witness journey, I think most of us know, but it is one of the most unforgettable events that has happened in, the, happened in the history of mankind, especially in the history of Israel. That the Israelites had spent 40 years in the desert. Now, after the deliverance and exodus uh, from the life of slavery in, in Egypt for 400 years, the Bible recorded for us the record of almost 2 million people who actually includes men, women, children, who has wandered the desert for 40 years. Now, God promised to lead his people to the promised land, the land that is flowing, honey, milk and honey, the land that is fruitfulness, and the land that they can call their own because they are God's possession. Okay? So that was what God has promised to them. <clears throat> now, this evening I took uh, my resources from, I think all of us will know, uh, from the second book of the History of Redemption series, and of course, the Holy Word. Now, the wilderness journey happened, it's not a myth, right? It's not a myth, although some, uh, some people uh, don't believe it, but geographically, historically, archaeologically, and biblically, it has happened, right? And it happened right in the center of uh, the earth. If you, if you look Google, you'll find that Jerusalem uh, is actually at the center, right? Now, as we zoom down this evening, okay, uh, we zoom down to this part where of the world where the wilderness journey has happened. All right, uh, you can see that on this map here, we have, uh, <clears throat> now the, when the when Israelites came out from Egypt, they came out from Ramses, and they are supposed to, uh, they are go, they're supposed to be in the promised land, which is Canaan up there. Now, this distance is about 250 kilometers or two to 300, and probably take about 11 days by, by foot. Okay? And this map shows us also the, the 40 years, the cities, the 42 campsites they actually gone through. Now, we'll go into details later, but of course, tonight we'll not cover all the 40 campsites. Okay, we'll zoom down to a few. Um, now, before that, let's uh, put into some context. Uh, the f first, I'm going to look at the physical context. Now, the word wilderness, right? The word wilderness means wild, uncultivated. It refers to the, the natural wild state okay, of, of a piece of land. And it's not suitable for growing crops because it's barren, it is dry, and it's hard. It is hardened ground. So we can see from Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 6, all right, uh, how he described the wilderness. It is full of beets, you know, beets, uh, very dangerous. It is, it is very dark, okay, very dark at night. So this is the kind of terrain that the Israelites went through for 40 over years. Can anybody survive in that kind of uh, environment. Now, on top of that, you know, in the wilderness, uh, the desert places, the temperature are pretty extreme. Now, in the daytime, it can go up to as high as 55 degrees Celsius. And in the night, it can go up to go down to minus even four degrees. The humidity is uh, is very low, very dry. Now, we like to go camping, right? I think Singaporeans like to go camping. <laughs> okay, uh, probably one, one, two, one, two days, you, you'll, be, you'll be enjoying yourself. But anything stretching beyond, beyond five, seven days, I think you feel very uncomfortable. Eh? I want to go home. You know, imagine these two million people live there for 40 over years, and not only that, they actually move from one place to another. We'll talk about it a bit later. 
Now, how do they live in the desert? Uh, may not be exactly what you see here, but something like this. All right? A tent. Okay, they live in a tent. Uh, now, we like, to live, we like to live in such tent right, when we go camping for a few days. But imagine living in such tent and moving around for, the last, for 40 years. Okay? So you can see uh, why sometimes when we look at the, the Bible, the Israelites grumble. Okay? They grumble a lot. Then when I think it over, as I prepare this, I think it over, sometimes that grumble seems quite legitimate because they are living in a very, very harsh condition. All right? Especially the children, the women, and the older people. Now, I'm not sure how long I can live in such a condition. Maybe one day, maybe two days. That will be my faith. <laughs> okay? The reason why I'm presenting this is so that we can, as we go through the wilderness journey, we can appreciate, you know, the, not just the hour, but the feelings of the people, right? Because they are, they are under this harsh physical condition. Okay, this is the map I just showed you just now. Uh, so, the Israelites left Egypt at Ramsey, okay, Ramses. Uh, and, and they are supposed to uh, reach the land of Canaan. As I mentioned just now, it takes about 11 days' journey. Now, you look at the map here. What is the shortest route? Right? If you look at uh, the arrow, the first route is uh, the route we call it uh, by the, the route of the, the way of the, the land of the Philistines. Now, this route, it takes about 11 days. Okay. Now, this road is along, along, as you can see, it's along the coast, coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. And, but it has to pass through the city of Philistines. And we know that the Philistines are the enemies of God. Okay. And, of course, God uh, didn't lead them by this way. Okay. In uh, Exodus 13, 13, 17, it says, God says, Lest the people change their minds when they see war okay, and return to Egypt. So God knew, God knew the fear and the lack of faith of his people who just came out of Egypt. He knew that they would rather return to Egypt as a slave than fight the war in order to go through this path. Then, uh, there could be a second route if you look at the second arrow. The second route is a bit longer. It's by the way of Shur. Okay, Shur is by way of Shur. This route starts from uh, Goshen. Goshen is the, the place where they, the Israelites lived when they were in Egypt. Right? And it passes through Sakov. Sakov is the first campsite. And then through the heart, through the heart of the uh, the wilderness of Shur, and then heading through the center sorry, of the southern Canaan. So they, they can actually go by this uh, though longer, longer route, but God did not lead them. It probably takes more than 11 days, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's about a month or two. Okay. Now, never mind. So, uh, they went further down, they continued downwards, and they come to a possible third route where they can take and go to Canaan. This route is, of course, much longer. It started from, uh, as you can see, from on, on the, on the left-hand side, uh, in Egypt. It passed through the northern part of the Gau, the, the Gau of Suez, across the central area of the Sinai Peninsula, ending at the northern tip of the Gulf of Aquiba. Aquiba is a... Uh, uh, here, I don't know where I can see my... Okay, on the right. And from there, uh, the Israelites could continue northwards into the King's Highway on the eastern side of Jordan and pass through uh, 
the plains of Moab, and then they cross over to Jordan. So it's a very long road. Okay, but it is still possible. Maybe think about three months. All right? This is just my estimation, not the Bible, all right? Uh, because they travel about uh, 25 kilometers a day. La. Now, God did not lead them to any one of those routes. Right? In fact, God asked them to direct them, continue them uh, downwards, towards the direction of the Red Sea. Now, I'm sure if you are one of those uh, Israelites who travel, by the time the God direct them to the Red Sea, uh, you'll be scratching your head, right? Uh, what is God trying to do, right? There'll be many, many questions uh, in their mind. Now, some of those questions may be something like this. <clears throat> now, what has gone wrong? Okay. Was God not keeping His promise that we are going to the promised land? Did God not make, or did God make a mistake? Somehow, God made a mistake. Was it a situation where God cannot foresee. God didn't foresee that this is going to happen. Then they probably have regretted, was it a mistake to come out of Egypt? Now, I'm sure the Israelites were uh, probably discussing about this even among themselves in, the, in their camp. Okay? Now, if you look at these questions carefully, uh, does it sound familiar to us? We do ask these questions in our journey of faith. Right? These are some very legitimate questions uh, asked by the Israelites because they couldn't understand by human logic why God didn't choose any of those three ways, but instead direct them towards the Red Sea. Now, it is, it is very common for us, okay, to ask such questions in our mind when we couldn't understand God. Okay, we pray for something, God give us something. We are taught we are going this way, but God leads us in another way in our journey of faith. And this is actually precisely what the wilderness journey is all about. The wilderness journey actually mirrors our spiritual journey. Okay? Now, as I, as I look, as I study uh, the wilderness journey in detail, I see more and more of myself in there. It mirrors us, it mirrors my, my journey of faith. And not only me, it mirrors the church. What happened even in today's church? Now, even in Acts chapter 7, verse 38, the Bible refers the two million Israelites traveling in the wilderness as a congregation, as a church as a body of God's people. And in fact, what happened during these 40 years of wilderness journey reflects very much the same situation that happened in some churches. The attitude of the believers, the behavior of the believers towards their holy God. We can see more as we go through later on. So as we go through the 42 campsite, of the winner's journey, we see ourselves very much like the Israelites. As I mentioned, I see, I see that in me too. Our sinful condition, our behavior towards a God who loves us, who possesses us, who is holy. So why was the winner's journey recorded in the Bible? Now we know in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. He said, all scriptures are inspired or breathed by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That a man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So we know that the scripture is recorded for our instruction, including the narrative of the wilderness journey. <clears throat> now, let's look at Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> now, I won't read the, the whole passage, okay? But the, the top part is talking about how the Israelites went through the, 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 
the Red Sea, you know, and so on. And you come to verse 11, he says, these things happen to them as an example that they will return down for our instruction. So God is teaching us in this century, in this age, the lessons that we can learn from the wilderness journey. And it's meant for, for our good. So the question, of course, is what lesson can we learn? What can we, lesson can we learn? <clears throat> now, in their 40 years of their wilderness journey, despite of God's patience and love, the Israelites continue they are be, to, to behave sinfully in His presence. All right? They continue to harbor their desires for evil. They commit sins of idolatry, sexual immorality. They grumble a lot and they tested God. Now, of course, eventually, when the judgment of God came, uh, God actually wiped the first generation of the Israelites who came out of Egypt. Okay? Because they are unrepentant. Now, how do we learn from here? Now, we too should not take our relationship with God lightly. Sin. Sin breaks our fellowship with God. We need to repent from our sinful ways, our sinful desires and sinful habits, and turn away from our wicked ways and allow God to transform us to be his holy people. This is what God wants us to learn from the wilderness journey. So this, this is what God wants us to be, uh, his people. And we know that on the final day of Christ, on the day of Christ, God will pronounce his final judgment. Now let's look at the spiritual context. Now, one question that one may ask is, is the exodus of the two million people from the land of slavery and subsequent their journey through the wilderness is an afterthought of God? That means, that means God didn't plan it at first and then along the way, he, he thinks that he should uh, insert this into his, uh, into his um, redemption plan. Right? <coughs> Now, in Exodus 32, verse 23, we learn that the Israelites cried for rescue from their suffering in the suffering in the land of slavery, the Egypt. And God hear their cry. And then the Bible says God remember their covenant. God remember his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, does God, have God forgotten that his people is in Egypt? It's recorded in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. Obviously, the answer is no, right? All the time, God is watching. God knows what is happening. Okay? The historicity of Exodus was part of the fulfillment of the covenant of torch. Now, in Genesis chapter 15, God re-established his covenant with Abraham that through him, God will create a nation of to Abraham offspring. And in that covenant, okay, in that covenant, before that can happen, before they become a nation, they must be the offspring will be in sojourners in a land which does not belong to them. It's not theirs. And they will be fitted for four hundred years before God will bring them out. Of their great of their slavery with great possessions. Now the covenant of the Tosh was actually established somewhere around uh, 20, 2082 or 2062 BC or 82 BC. The Exodus was it takes place in uh, 1446. So there's a period of uh, 
six, in between 633 years, right? So it is, it, is, it is not an afterthought of God. God has already planned the Exodus long before it actually happens. So we have covered the, so far we have covered the physical context and the spiritual context. Now this will provide us a background as we look into the specific campsites in the wilderness journey. Okay. God is sovereign. God knows the end from the beginning. And nothing actually happened by chance, though it seems to be. Now, the, the Israelites travel to the 42 campsite, recorded in Numbers, the book of Numbers, Exodus, and Deuteronomy. Now, in this lecture, we just look at Tonight, we just look at the 10, all right? Hopefully, uh, we look at 10. Uh, so as we embark on this journey, I'd like to invite you on board, right? So now you know the context. Imagine yourself as one of those 2 million people who came out of the land of Egypt, the land of slavery. Okay, so as we go to each campsite, uh, try to put your, yourself in and uh, probably we can appreciate much more. Okay. Okay, let's look at the first campsite, Sakor. Okay. This is the first campsite after they, uh, they came out of uh, Egypt. Now, the word Sakor means uh, shelter. It means tent. Okay. Now, it gives you the idea of uh, protection and safety. In fact, throughout the wilderness, the Israelites live in shelter or tent. That's how I, I show you the picture, right? Uh, in fact, when they entered the land of Canaan, God actually instructed them to remember how they live while they are in wilderness. So God instit us instituted the feast of the booths. Okay, booths means a shelter. I think up to today, they still celebrate, right? Yeah, they still celebrate. So God leave a memorial to prove that the event happened, to prove, to record down his intervention in mankind, to record down his love and his guidance uh, to the Jews and now to us. So the Israelites came out of Egypt as a great nation, as a nation, all right, with great victory after 400 years. So it was really a day of salvation, a day of salvation, and they came out on the 15th day of the first month of the Jewish calendar, okay? After a night of Passover, when the Lord gave his final judgment, the final plate on the Egyptian by the death of their firstborn. So as they, as promised, they came out with great possessions, gold, silver, treasure possessions that belongs to the Egyptians. And probably they also brought along their personal belongings, the livestock, the sheep, the cattle, and other animals. So imagine you were there. It was a great sight, right? Two million people moving out with all these things. Okay? Uh, in the modern days, probably there'll be a lot of uh, uh, reporters and cameras so, Sakot is about 52 kilo, kilometers from Ramses, the place where they left Egypt. It is about two days' journey. Now, it is normally a resting stop for those, who, those travelers who are going to Egypt. So, as the Israelites depart from Ramses in victory, they move towards Sakot. And Although among the two million people, I'm sure some of them will be, will move with a different emotional state. Some will be happy, uh, some don't know what is happening, just follow the crowd, Am I right? But some will be, I'm sure quite a lot of them will, will actually move with fear, okay? With fear and uncertainty, uncertainty, what will lies ahead of them? So Sarkos actually provide a place for them to rest after two days' journey, and perhaps to try 
to recollect what has happened the last two days, how does it make sense to them? Okay, they're still trying to figure out, uh, some of them are trying to figure out what is happening. Now, at Sakol, we notice that the Israelites ate unleavened bread. Okay, unleavened bread. Now, leaven is, leaven is yeast uh, that help to raise, right to, right to ferment and raise uh, the dough. You know, when we make bread, we, we raise it up. Now, of course, uh, unleavened or uh, leavened bread is much nicer to eat. It's softer and nicer. Unleavened bread is quite hard, right? It's quite hard. Now, we read from the verse there, it's, it seems to, to suggest that, or it, it suggests that the reason why they eat unleavened bread or add unleavened bread was because they are coming out of Egypt in a rush. Okay? But the key reason is actually more significant. Okay? It's actually more significant. Uh, in Exodus chapter 13, verse 2, God actually instructed Moses to institute the yearly feast of unleavened bread as a memorial to remember his deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt. Okay? So it is more than just uh, the reason of coming out fast. But in the New Testament, this concept of leavened bread is actually mentioned. So what is so significant about leavened <coughs> being used as a metaphor in the Bible? Now we look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 5 and 6. Now when the disciples <coughs> when the disciples reached the other side, okay, uh, the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Wash and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them, Beware of the leaven of the bread, but beware of the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So when the Bible mentions about leaven, uh, it's, okay, it's referring to the false teaching. Okay? Jesus was warning the disciples the false teaching uh, by the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, this is, this is a warning to us too. Now, we need to be aware of false teaching, especially nowadays. It's so prevalent okay, these days, and it's so subtle that we, it, it's actually creeping into the church without the church even noticing it. Okay? So the church is very vulnerable to the infiltration of false teaching. And from, sometimes from within and sometimes from without. Hence, the church needs to be well equipped in the truth of God's word. There's no substitute. Okay? There's, no really sub, there's no substitute for a personal study of God's word. So we need to be disciplined to study his word regularly, to be grounded in the truth. Okay, to be grounded in the truth. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, 12, 13 and 14, Paul reminded the Ephesus, the Christian in Ephesus, that they should not be behaving like children. They, they, you should, you should, they, should be, they should not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but by human craftiness, by deceitful schemes. So the only way, the only way to, to really be able to discern the false teaching is to grow in the Word of God, be matured in handling the Word of God accurately. That's what Paul told Timothy. Now, I just want to mention a little bit. Now, the Bible is the best selling book in the world. But the truth is that, unfortunately, the Bible is not the best read book in the world. We, we buy beautiful Bibles is, and for display. So, brothers and sisters, may this year be a year where, tell yourself, get, I must get into the Word and get into the Word deeply. Now, the second campsite is Etham. Uh, 
Now, Etam is about one day's journey from Sakot. Okay. Uh, it means for, it means defense. Now, true to the meaning of Etam, God became a fort and defense, and defense wall of Israel. At this Etam, God's presence was very visible through the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Okay, to protect and guide them for the rest of their journey in the wilderness. Now, the Israelites need that. As we've seen just now, the wilderness is full of pit falls, many dryness without water, no vegetation. It was very, very dark at night. Now, even with the best navigation that we have, I don't think anyone can survive there. Right? And moreover, we are talking about what? We are talking about finding a place, each time to place for 2 million people. Uh, maybe the size of Olens, I know Olens and Amokyo combined, that kind of place. <laughs> okay. So really, uh, God has to be with them. Otherwise, they, they will perish. And we know just now on top of that, the weather was also very extreme, cold in the night, very cold in the night and very hot in the, the day. So God knows their needs. We know that if God was not with them, God, they will die. Now, so the pillar of cloud and fire uh, actually stay with them for the whole period of 40 years. Okay. Now, as we reflect on this, what can we learn? Now, in our journey of life, in our journey of faith, I think all of us are uncertain about our future, even though we have faith in, we so-called, we claim to have faith in God. All right? So despite the fact that God assures us of His presence, are uh, always there, many times we still feel fearful, afraid. Okay? We feel this way because we tend to focus on ourselves rather than to focus and trust in God. And yet, although we cannot see God, but we know God is there because in our own personal experience and encounter, we know that God is, is always guiding us. Okay? And that's why until today we are still here because we have the inner weakness of the living God the living Christ in us. Ooh. So let us learn how to trust God in all our situations because the promise of God still holds in Hebrews, right? That He will never leave us or forsake us. This is a very powerful truth. It will take away all our fears and all our anxieties of life. So may, not, may, may God help us Right? To, to trust in Him, claim our His promise that His presence is always with us. The only, thing he, the only situation He can forsake us is if we choose to forsake Him. Now, the third campsite uh, is called uh, Mikdov, all right? Mikdov. Okay? It means fortress or tower. Now, in Exodus 14, verse 1 and 2, uh, so the Israelites were traveling downwards, right? They were, tra they were traveling downwards uh, by the western side to maybe by the western side of the Red Sea, right? You can see the arrow, okay? Uh, but what did God say? God asked them to, to turn back, okay? God asked them to turn back towards and camp by the Red Sea. Now, does that sound logical? Okay. Again, it doesn't sound logical, right? The Egyptians were chasing behind them, actually, and God asked them to encamp by the sea. So what happened? They were trapped in a corner. 
In front is the Red Sea. Behind is the 600 elite chariots and horsemen of the Egyptians. So the Israelites were very fearful. I think that's a very natural uh, emotion. Uh, if you are there, probably you'll feel the same. Thinking that, oh, now I'm doomed. Okay, I'm doomed. So they cry to God. But it's quite easy to know that they cry to God, not because of their faith, because they have no choice. And they are desperate. Okay? Uh, like some, some of us, uh, we do, 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 do that. And what else do they do? Let's look at uh, the verse here. Okay. They criticize. Right? They criticize Moses. Wow, the criticism is so uh, heart-piercing. Okay? I will read slowly for you. Is it because there is no grave in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is it not what we say to you earlier? You know, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for, you know, it is better, it could have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Wow. If you were Moses, and Aaron, how would, you, how would you feel? How would you feel at that point in time? Okay. Now, the feelings of the, the, feelings of the Israelites is understandable. Okay. Uh, because they are actually at the dead end, so-called the dead end. But they have just saw how God delivered them, right? Uh, with the, in Egypt. So where is their trust? in God at this point in time. Okay? Now, Moses did not focus on self-pity. Ah, these people. But rather, he encouraged them not to fear, but to trust God. Okay? Now, the lesson for us to learn is, now, although we claim to believe the Bible, we do fear about some situation in our life, right? and around us. Uh, we fear of uh, possible death, possible illness. We fear about running out of money. And in the current situation, I do know of Christians who are really fearful of the pandemic. Okay? I call one pastor friend, uh, just asking out for coffee. He then not to come out. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, understandable, but I was, I was thinking probably it's very much gripped by fear, okay? So there are many people like that during this time, including Christians. Now, we must remember the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. So our, well, on this part of the journey of faith in Christ, we need, we need to learn to look up in faith, like Moses, believing that his guidance, his direction, is meant for our good, even though we may not understand it. Now, this coming new year is going to be, you and I will have situations that we never expect to happen. Okay? So be prepared. We want to tell ourselves, God, I really want to trust you. Okay? As I go through this journey in the year two. 2022. So despite all the lack of faith, God protected and delivered them, right? From the hands of the Egyptians. And we know what happened, right? Uh, Okay, in, the, in Exodus chapter 14, verse 19, the angel of the Lord okay, went behind them and the pillar of, and coming in between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. So the, the pillar of crowd actually protected them like a fortress. Okay, so the Egyptian soldier can 
never crossed over. Until they all safely went across the other side, the Egyptian soldier goes and chased after them. But it was too late, right? God closed the, God closed the, the water. Now, in the same way, God, our salvation is a deliverance from God, just the way God delivered the Israelites. When they come to a day end, God delivered them. Okay? And God, in the same way, God delivered us from that bondage of slavery in, of our sin. Okay? God set us free from this bondage, and we are delivered. Now we have a choice to live the new life in Christ. So after the, as I mentioned just now, after the Israelites cross over the Red Sea, the Egyptians start to pursue them, but God covered them, all right? God buried them, and none of them actually survived. So this is a very event, eventful happenings in the history of the Israelites. Now today, you can still, uh, people are still researching on finding out all the uh, the chariot wheels under the sea, you know, uh, and see whether there are still bones there. Okay, so historically it can be proven. So just as the, the meaning of Migot suggested, the protection and the delivery of Israelites continue to remind us that our Lord, who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, is the only tower of refuge and a strong fortress. Okay, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, as declared in Psalms 2. Now, the next campsite is Mara. Mara means Peter. Okay, so the Israelites were praising God, you know, after they delivered them, they, they prayed tambourine, okay, and they were singing and singing. They traveled for three days, and they come to this uh, campsite called Mara. After three days, they were thirsty, and perhaps hungry, so they were very happy when they saw the pool of water. And guess what happened? When they tasted the water, the water was bitter. Now guess what is their response when they tasted the bitter water? They just saw God delivering them from the Red Sea only three days ago. They grumble. Okay, they grumble, they, cr- uh, they grumble against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Yes, they grumble again. So it seems that their memory is very short. They cannot remember three days ago what God has done for them. Right? Uh, they just witnessed the power of God just a short while ago. They were on cloud nine three days ago and now they are right at the bottom. Does that sound familiar to us? This morning, I'm doing my devotion. Wow, so happy. The Lord teach me this. Uh, when I get to the office, uh, one, of my, one, of my, one of my boss says something negative to me. Oh, I just couldn't stand it anymore. You know, the, the anger about to burst up and, and so on. Okay, now, so how many times have we experienced God's answering our prayers? and we will feel with thank, thanksgiving. But a while later, you know, when things go wrong, we begin to crumble. So very familiar. The witness journey mirror our Christian life. Okay? So, our resp- <clears throat> so the response of the Israelites very much mirror ourselves. It shows us how sinful we are, and by default, our sinful flesh cannot appreciate God and will not worship God. And that's why we need God to continue to work in us and we must continue to allow God to do that if we are to be His holy people and part of His holy nation. God is gracious to the Israelites despite of their gambling. So God told Moses to throw a tree log into the water and the water becomes sweet. Okay. 
So if we trust God, God will use that situation for the benefit of us. He will turn our bitter situation to sweetness if we trust in Him. Now, after turning the bitter water sweet, God issued the, for the first time since they left Egypt His statute and regulation to test the obedience of His people. Right, as you can see in uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 25, 26. The statute is His law, His law, God's law. Now, God will do the same to us, right? God will test His people for their obedience in their spiritual journey. Now, we can sing, we can praise God about all the good things, but the true mark of our love for God is our obedience to His commandments, right? God will test us, our obedience, in every situation of our life. He will put our lives to see if we, how we respond in those situations, whether we betray Him or we obey Him. So in John 14, 21, right, it's very clear. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. So we say we love God, then that love is proven through our obedience for Him. Okay? And how did God do that? God will put situations in our life to test us our obedience. Now, the next campsite is Elim. Now, Elim is a, means large trees and strength. Uh, now, it gives it give the idea that it is a cooling place uh, to recover from, to gain new energy, right? To a refreshment kind of uh, place. Indeed, it was, all right? In Elim, there's an oasis uh, filled with many streams and springs. It looks so refreshing and inviting after a 10 kilometers walk from Mara okay, to Elim, okay, through the difficult terrain. So beside the springs of cool water and refreshing uh, air, there were 17 dead palms, dead palm trees. Okay, they were tall, as high as uh, 25 meters, and the palm trees at the top, they are feather light, right? Feather light leaves which give we span across about two meters to three meters, providing the shade from the scorching sun. So imagine you reach that place after a long, tiring walk. That was a really a welcome and refreshing uh, time. The Israelites probably walked through already walked through ten days, okay, uh, in the wilderness journey. So within that short event, many things happened. So they were tired, they were, they were thirsty, and when it came to Elim, it was really a time of refreshment. Now, brothers and sisters, this picture of the Israelite resting and relaxing beside the springs of water in Elim reminds us of a picture, okay? Reminds us of our needs to restore and renew our souls. And that brings us to what? King David expressed it in Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quietus. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness. Now, in our journey of faith, it's a long, our journey of faith is a long one, like the witness journey. It has up and down. We better with sin, we better with flesh, we better with the devil, and we better to live the holy life. But many times we feel like giving up because the journey seems to be very tiring, uh, very exhaustive, okay? Thinking that it's much easier if we go back to our old life of self-centeredness and sin. Now, I want to say this evening that God understands our working out of the salvation to please Him. He will renew us. He will restore us. Now, such restoration of our souls requires us to wait upon the Lord. 
those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. That is the promise. And so we need to regularly spend time with God, wait upon Him in prayer and in meditation of His Word. And allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us during those times. Do not rush into doing too many things so that we don't have time for God. Okay? Let God Himself spend time with God regularly. Just like what Jesus did, eh? Jesus did in Mark 1.35. Now, well, and raising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to an isolated place. Now, this verse gives us a peek into the private life of Jesus. He's probably doing this very regularly, spending time with God. And that's how he renewed. Remember, Jesus was at that time a human being in, human, in his humanity. Okay? Okay, the next campsite is by the sea. Uh, so after, <coughs> after the fifth campsite in Lim, they continue to travel by the sea. And uh, Red Sea means the sea of reed. You know what's a reed, right? A reed is, uh, a reed is about two to three meters. The stems are actually hollow. They have joints in between. Okay? They are firm and straight, but they are not good enough to be used as a walking stick. Now, perhaps this reflects the weakness of the faith of the Israelites, how they were easily swayed by the wind of their circumstances. Okay? They may look strong outside, but on the inside, they are weak in their faith. Now, it reminds us of ourselves that we need to build that strong inner life of faith in Christ so that our values, our morals are, not, are rooted in the foundation of the rock of Christ. We will not be swayed here and there by our situation. Okay, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, remind us that even though our external body is decaying day by day, but God will renew us, will restore us in our inner soul if we choose it to be. Okay, the next campsite is a witness of sin. Uh, now, know that the name within the was seen doesn't mean this is a sinful place. It's just the name of the, the desert place. Okay, it means a thorny bush, thorny bush, and swampy land. Okay. Now, now know that uh, I just want to highlight something now. In, you know that in Exodus, uh, it mentioned that they went out for a limb and came to the wilderness, the wilderness of sin. It missed out the previous, uh, it actually missed out the previous campsite, which is mentioned in Numbers, all right? So by the time the, the Israelites arrived at with the wilderness of sin, it was about a month after they came out of Egypt. Now, by now, their food is running out, okay? Their food is running out. The food brought out, uh, they brought out from Egypt. Now, guess what happened? How they respond when they are run out of food? Can you guess what happened? Yeah. We know their default behavior, right? Okay? They grumble. Okay? They will grumble. Uh, they grumble. They grumble against the leadership. And this time, how many people grumble? The whole congregation, the whole congregation. Wow. And what did they say? Uh, they say to Moses, For you have brought us out of this, into this wilderness to kill us, to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Sounds like a mass killing, right? Sounds like a massacre of two million people. Now, just, just, a, just, a, just a note to take note. Now, I'm, sure, I'm sure many of these, these two main people, they probably are instigated by a few people, right? If we notice that when some of the rebels that comes out from uh, Egypt, 
they are the one who actually are causing the trouble. They are instigating uh, the people to, you know, to go against the leadership, uh, to criticize the leadership. Okay, so we, we must be careful not to be have that kind of rebel spirit uh, in the church. Okay, it can be very discouraging. It can be very decisive, uh, divisive. Uh, for the church. So the words of Moses, the word of the Israelites to Moses and Aaron, they were like a thousand thorns, right? Piercing through their hearts. The tremendous stress and load were loaded upon Aaron and Moses' leadership. Now I can I can't imagine, right? I can't imagine what would happen if it's myself in the situation. I probably would die. Uh, commit suicide, okay? Now, these steep neck people, that's what the, God called them, never learned their lesson, right? After God has done so many things for them to see, they never really, they never learned that lesson, okay? Now, when I reflect on this, uh, I, feel, I feel very sad about certain stories that I heard, right? I come across how some pastors... Uh, or even leaders have actually resigned from the church because they couldn't take the, the negative criticism uh, from the church members, some of the church members. They had done what they can uh, for the congregation, they, but they were not appreciated. Instead, they will receive negative criticism, and probably in some cases, uh, they will ask them to, to, to leave the church. Now, I just want to mention that many times we forgot that our leaders in the church are fallen people like us. They are not angels. They are exactly like us. They need encouragement and support. And then we need to recognize them as God's appointed leadership. So when we grumble against our leadership, we're actually grumbling against God. So we just have to be careful of that. Okay? Do not fall into the same uh, behavior as the Israelites. Now, despite of what the Israelites uh, severe grumbling, God did not give up, right? Uh, God gave instruction. God sent out, poured out the bread from heaven. Okay? Uh, so that was a, a, a really blessings from God. Now, the instruction for people to gather the bread only for one day because God wants to teach them that they have to depend on Him as reflected in the Lord's Prayer. Teach us this day, our, give us this day our daily bread. So God is so gracious, despite of His anger, which could have consumed them straight away when they, they criticized against Moses and Aaron. God was still very merciful to them. Okay? God was merciful, gracious, low to anger, and abound in steadfast love. So let's not take the grace of God for granted. God's grace should lead us to repentance from our sins and turn back to Him. Okay? If we continue to sin, the wrath of God will fall upon us. Okay, the next uh, campsite is uh, Dokka. Now, Dokka is about 500 kilometers northwest of Mount Sinai. Now, Dokka means drover. Drover means uh, someone who actually drives, you know, the cattle, the sheep, you know, a bit like cowboy, eh? a bit of cowboy. Now, it was estimated that uh, the Israelites remained in wilderness of sin for about at least a week. And perhaps they're enjoying... Uh, their wafer, their bread from heaven. Okay, they were so comfortable. They ex- they have a new experience of them. How the manna came down from heaven every day, except on the, the seventh day. Now this new experience was really uh, very thrilling, and perhaps it's so so thrilling that they want to stay a bit longer. But God actually drove, okay, drove them out, and that probably the reason why they call this place uh, Dover. Okay. To continue to God drive them to continue the journey. Now, 
The, the next campsite, the ninth campsite is Alash. Now, Alash is the second campsite that God provided the manna after the wilderness. So they are still enjoying it. Okay? And in uh, Exodus chapter 16, verse 1, uh, we see that after the six days of manna, uh, God told them how to bake and boil okay? the manna. At first, they were just taking uh, as it is, but it's nice. But there are now different ways that God teach them to, 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 to cook. So they are probably enjoying themselves. Okay? So alash means knead, knead the dove. You know, when you, when, you, when you are making the bread, you need the dove, right? Enjoying yourself, right? Okay? So alash is probably a place where they are relaxing. You know, they are, it's a playtime. You know, relax time, play time. They are making the dog, experiencing uh, different recipes. Okay? And, and such times are legitimate. We, we need that. Okay? In our Christian journey, we need that. Uh, we need time to do certain things just to distress ourselves emotionally. And God, God will provide those times. Right? Now, as we look at the last campsite tonight, uh, they came to this uh, Rephidim. Now, Rephidim means a resting place, a place of Sabbath. So it sounds like it is it's really a very good place. Now, it's actually a very beautiful place. It's located about 20 kilometers northwest of Mount Sinai. Okay, currently, if you look at the, the, the modern map, it's actually Wadi Faran, all right? It's a place called Wadi Faran. It's supposed to be an oasis. Now, Oasis is a, is a fertile region in the desert uh, where there is water, plants can grow, and animals can, can live around there. Okay, so it's a, it's a region, uh, it's a welcoming place in the desert. But guess what happened when the Israelites reached there? The Oasis dry up. There's no water. And guess what is the response? After seeing all those things in the, in the first few campsite, what's the response? Yes. Not difficult to guess, all right? Because we are also like that. All right? This time, they don't only grumble, they quarrel. They quarrel with Moses, uh, give us water. And the people grumble against Moses. Now imagine you, Moses. Moses really have a very difficult job, right? Really, really difficult job. It looks like the Israelites never, never learned the lesson. Okay? I think by now Moses must be very, very tired, very, very weary, and understandably so, right? Okay? Not only they accuse him again, but they almost stone him. Right? They wanted to kill him. So Moses, out of that despair, he probably tell God, God, what should I do with these people? Right? So his words are probably words of great disappointment, great despair, and probably at the verge of quitting. Okay? But by the grace of God, God intervened and instructed him to strike the rock and water flow out to quench the thirst of the two million people. So Moses called the place Massa and Meribat because they were quarreling, the, the people were quarreling, and because the people tested God. So at Rephidim, something happened as well. Okay? In their journey, the first enemy came, the Amalekites. They came and found the Israelites. Okay? This poor Joseph, uh, Moses, right? he has to handle the war within them, seems, uh, within the congregation, and now he has handled the war uh, beyond outside. Okay, not only, but God was, uh, God was with Moses. Okay? God was with Moses and Joshua. God who was God's assistant, 
So Joshua led some of the chosen Israelites to fight against the Amalekites, the Amalite, while Moses was standing at a hilltop holding the staff of God, praying with Aaron and her. Now again, we saw much of God's grace and compassion despite of what Israelites' uh, behavior. They really have a very serious uh, behavior or disbelief. God will help his anger. Okay, in Isaiah 54, verse uh, 8, it tells us, <clears throat> In overflowing anger, for a moment, I hide my face from you. But with everlasting love, I have compassion on you. So God will hold his anger from the Israelites and continue to show his compassion and love for his people. And God is, is doing the same thing to us. Okay? God is going to do this. God will continue to do the same thing to us. But there's a point if we don't repent, God will pronounce his judgment. Okay, tonight we have covered the, the 10 campsite. Uh, let's do a summary, right? Let's do a summary. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'm here, what we call the, the work cloud, right? The work cloud. Okay, uh, as Pastor Samuel said, I'm in the area of data analytics. So this is data visualization. <laughs> now, work cloud is a quick way to visualize, uh, highlight the frequency of the keywords or important words in the, in the, in the text, in a set of text document. So of course, the text document, I, I, I put in the text from Exodus 15, 22 to 17, 14. That's where they move from Red Sea to Rephidim and see what words comes out. So the, the size of the words you know, tell us the frequency, how frequent the keywords appear. Now, of course, here you can see quite a lot of keywords. Of course, the Lord will appear many times in this, right? So is Moses, because it's the story of Moses as well. Okay. Uh, now, I want you to search for the words that reflect how the people relate to God. Okay. Are you able to see? Yeah. The verb is a verb. So what words appears? Search for the words that reflect how the people relate to God in this picture. So what word do you think that is? What word? Grumbling, right? And grumble. Okay? So that almost summarizes uh, this passage about the behavior of the Israelites. And probably reflect very much on us as well. So let's do a quick summary before we pray. Right? So in this, uh, in this tonight sharing, uh, we see how God fulfilled the covenant of torch by delivering his people out of the land of slavery after 400 years. And in this part of the winner's journey, we see God deliver his people by, through the crossing of the Red Sea, led them by the pillar of cloud and fire, provided bread from heaven and water, and refresh them and restore them, you know, beside the oasis. So, God's people, but despite all that, God's people continue to sin of, of grumbling and criticize against God's appointed leadership, right? But God continue His steadfast love and patience. And today, God continues to deal in the same way to us as his people. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. As we look at our four, the behaviors of our forefathers, Lord, we see very much of ourselves. We pray that you will help us to learn, not to follow them, but to learn to appreciate your grace, your compassion, and your mercy, and to live a life that is worthy of your choice, the choice that you have redeemed us from our darkness into the marvelous light. 
Help us as we commit ourselves to you that we may grow in holiness, we may grow in repentance, we may, we may grow in our love for you and for our neighbours. We thank you, Lord, for this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.